At the seaside resort of Western Supermare, Andrew Day is something of a local celebrity. Last month, he became the subject of a landmark legal ruling. It all began with a bouncy castle. Andrew knew they were for children, but thought he'd have a go on one all the same. Six years ago, he went to a territorial army party where a bouncy castle was part of the entertainment. Andrew had been drinking, but he wasn't drunk. A lot of my friends that I'd gone to the party with just jumped on the castle for uh, a bit of fun. And leaving out with the lads and bouncing around and pushing each other and having a good time. I fell over and uh, someone managed to fall on top of me. I knew I'd broken my neck. The combination of a friend's weight and the uneven surface of the castle caused the break that paralysed him. Andrew used to run a garden centre, but had to give it up. His future looked bleak. I spoke to a local solicitor, and uh, he, he had, had the evidence, and turned around and said that there was no real claim, that uh, there, was, there was not enough evidence. So what were your thoughts after the first solicitor said that there was no case to answer? Well, I, I didn't think anything more about it. I just thought it was you know, a tragic accident and, you know, carry on with my life. And that was the end of the story until Andrew contacted solicitor Richard Breton, who, after a long battle, won legal aid for the case. In court, he argued that adults had been injured before on bouncy castles. The Territorial Army should never have hired it in the first place and the suppliers shouldn't have let them. Breton had won difficult cases before, but this one was a real gamble. This type of case, a new type of case, it's very risky. What, what were the risks? The risk was that uh, the judge would say, well, here's a young man, he's had a few beers. <laughs> it's his own fault. And if it wasn't his own fault, well, this is just something that, this is life. But the judge didn't think so. In a controversial ruling last month, he cleared Andrew of all blame. A chainsaw is a wolf in wolf's clothing, he said. A bouncy castle is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Andrew now stands to get a million pounds compensation. Does this necessarily mean that the accident has to be someone else's fault? No, no I don't think so, no. But did, were you surprised that the judge didn't attribute part of the fault to you? Yeah, I was, I, at the end of the day, I was accepting, I'd have accepted 50-50. Um, I went on there. They shouldn't have provided it. Um, it like I say, it could, have got, it could have gone either way. I could have ended up with nothing. And if that had happened, then I wouldn't have been totally surprised. What was the reaction of your colleagues when you got back to the office? I think some of them were surprised. Uh, I think some of them uh, thought that um, I got away with a case which I should never have won. That, that, that never worries me. Because every person that walks through my office or perhaps comes into my office in a wheelchair represents a challenge. But did the judge go too far in clearing Andrew of all blame? That's certainly how most people feel near his home in Western Supermare. Well, it's getting too easy now to get money, isn't it, really, by uh, trying to get onto the bandwagon like the Americans. Well, I don't think he should get it. I mean, it was his own fault. He shouldn't be playing around. He's a grown man. Well, whoever was in charge should have told him, really. Should have, there should have been somebody there to tell him not to go on it. Why should you have to warn an adult? An adult should know. Leading defence lawyer David McIntosh, who represents, among others, insurance companies, couldn't agree more. He believes the law has turned a dangerous corner. It's a sort of claim that a few years ago would have been laughed at as a possibility. This, is, this shows you how things are changing. A very experienced judge heard that case and found in favour of that particular claimant. But lawyers who bring these new actions say they're making the leisure industry and society in general safer for everyone. People are looking for a rather more thrilling, uh, sophisticated lifestyle. Um, they want to enjoy themselves in exciting ways. All you've got to do is look at the leisure parks and the leisure industry. It's, um, it's, it's a, a thriller moment. But against that, I think people expect uh, in life to be safer than they were ten years ago. And this is reflected in the legislation. Everywhere will be a no-go area. Nobody will play rugby. 
because two or three people are injured every match they play. Squash, you might lose an eye. Cricket, that's dangerous. What are we going to do with our lives? This is Creech Grange, a house with a long history of unrest. In the Civil War, Cromwell's troops burned it down. In fact, it's only this front that remains today. But more recently, it's been the centre of another long-running dispute, once again, between an outsider and the British establishment. The bailiff banged into the door and started shouting and he wanted to come in and, that, and I told him in no uncertain terms to clear off. He then ran round the house to another door and I got across and blocked that way and then I blocked the third door. And then he phoned me, and he was one side of the door on the phone, and I was the other. And he said he wanted to come in, and I told him to go away. And he would come at 6 o'clock in the morning. I could hear him walking around the house. Then they'd come at 11 o'clock at night. And when you went out, you were frightened that he was waiting in the dark. The bailiffs were trying to recover an alleged debt of £650,000. But Norman Hayward had been tipped off so he'd already removed every piece of furniture from his 26-bedroom house. We worked two days and two nights without stopping. We took everything from this house, everything, except my bed, I think. We rushed off with it and hired a, a mill where we stored some. We had a lorry full in the farm. We had another house full. We had friends putting stuff up. We had stuff everywhere. Eventually, the bailiffs left empty-handed. Lloyd's Bank had sent them in because of a long-running business dispute. Now then, Norman Hayward is a self-made man. He started out selling scrap metal from his dad's back garden and ended up buying and restoring his own stately home. He made his money in property, and in 1991, he became the very proud owner of Bournemouth Football Club. The club was heavily overdrawn at Lloyd's Bank, so Norman Hayward signed a personal guarantee of £650,000. I am a football person. I've been in football all my life, really. I thought I could do it. I thought um, I could save it. It was in a bad, bad way. It was about 2.3, 2.4 million overdrawn. And there was an 800,000 a year. The first year, I think we lost 400,000. That was the year I supported it for my own money. In the second year, we made a profit of 150,000. The third year, we made a profit of 150,000. And uh, I think that's the only time Bournemouth made a profit in the last 30 or 40 years. I did love the club, I did. <laughs> After I did. And uh, we, were, we did it, really. We, we were there, and it was taken from us. Despite the improving finances, Lloyds wanted the overdraft reduced. In 1994, the bank backed a takeover, hoping it would bring new capital into the club. After months of wrangling, Norman Hayward finally agreed to sell the club during an acrimonious meeting at Dean Court. The deal struck at Dean Court was a complex one, but Norman Hayward sold his shares on the understanding that his guarantees would be reduced from 650 to 400,000 pounds and that they wouldn't be called in until July of 1997 at the earliest. However, a full year before that, the club got into financial difficulties and the bank demanded not the £400,000, but the full £650,000. Norman Hayward had two choices, to pay what he thought was an unfair demand or to fight the bank through the courts. He decided to fight, even though he knew the costs would be enormous. He also claimed in court that Lloyds had reneged on promises about the club's overdraft. His legal campaign has been organised by Roy Pack, a former professional footballer who now specialises in cases against banks. Normally we're going to discuss the, uh, those cost issues. He said that you can see I've got the asset backing and uh, I'll give you a two million budget now and we shook hands on it 
and uh, he's never wavered at any given time some of the substantial accounts that I've given him. This goes on for year in, year out. When you, you're dealing with banks, Words and trains. everybody believes a bank and, and doesn't believe you. It's a known fact that, that if you want to fight a bank, you've got to have some incredibly good documents to do so. At one time, I was dead and buried, really. Without him, I would have been crucified, I believe. The trial was a test of integrity. Norman Hayward's version of events was very different from the bank, so who would the court believe? Well, after the first trial, the judge sided with the bank. It was a painful and expensive defeat for Norman Hayward. I couldn't really comprehend quite why I'd lost in a way. I, obviously, I knew I, it, was, it was possible, but um, just unbelieving and dark and lonely, quite honestly. A nightmare of, of stress, really, which doesn't go on for hours. It goes on for weeks and months and years. And, of course, your sleep patterns go, and uh, the whole thing just becomes an absolute battle. And you, as I was battling a, a great organisation, uh, you feel lonely, to say the least. Night time is the worst time. Nights are long when you're thinking about these things. You think, where well, I'm going to get the money? How much is the cost? I mean, we're talking millions, and it has to be found, and they don't let you off. They don't say, pay me £10 a week, or um, they come for you. By now, Norman Haywood was widowed, facing financial ruin and the loss of Creech Grange. He'd lost his claim about the club's overdraft, but appealed about the £650,000 guarantee. His whole case hinged on an undated note written by a bank manager. Now, the bank claimed that this note had been written before the meeting at Dean Court, but expert analysis proved that it had been written afterwards, and this simple fact supported Norman Hayward's story whilst discrediting the bank's version. The Court of Appeal ordered a retrial, Lloyds Bank declined to be interviewed, but said in a statement, This decision was not because of any failure in the bank's case, but rather what was perceived as an error in legal procedure by the judge in the original trial. consistent with the amounts to a what-if review. The retrial meant another expensive week in court, but at the end, Norman Hayward was vindicated. That I can accept Mr Hayward's account of his oral agreement. We won hands down with a great verdict, and the judge actually reading it out to us. And I was there with my family and uh, my friends, and uh, that was a good day, really good day. That yeah, was a good day. <laughs> and it cost you a substantial sum of money. And yeah, nine, nine years. Nine years. Nine years of your life. And then, after all this, they appealed that decision. Another few hundred thousand pounds costs. They've got an endless pit, you know. I'm oh, sorry about that, mate. It, it, it drives me nuts. Lloyds Bank lost the second appeal last summer. The bank said... This was based upon the judge deciding that an agreement had been reached between the bank and Mr Hayward, which was not supported by the formal documentation. Accordingly, the bank still believes that the decision was fundamentally flawed but we have to abide by the decision of the court. We've had 10 years of unbelievable cost. Norman Hayward says he spent more than two million pounds fighting his case. That they're going to another costing hearing, which is going to take another six or eight months. Now he faces another expensive court case, just to reclaim his costs. I wonder if you can put in a few words um, when I'm going to get it and how much you think. Well, the horrifying bit is it's going to cost more money because uh, we've got to pay for the legal team costing thing. The whole Norman Hayward says the real scandal is that without big money, people could never afford to take on the banks. 
you go from court case to court case. Costs, phenomenal costs, being racked up all the time by both sides. You're hamstrung. Everybody says you can't beat a bank. I didn't have to beat a bank. I, I was only sticking up for the truth. Today, for hundreds of people who have suffered serious illness from the effects of asbestos dust to claim compensation, until now the victims or their families have only been able to claim it if they were regularly exposed to asbestos. Today, judges said offices, factories or schools where only low levels of asbestos were found were liable. Our medical editor, Lawrence McGinty, reports. Thousands of schools built in the 60s and 70s contained asbestos. Anyone working on them has to wear protective clothing inside airlocks. But what about pupils breathing in even small amounts? Today, the Supreme Court ruled that employers are responsible for causing asbestos cancer, even if the amounts of dust involved are very small. Although the defendants didn't expose the victims to very much dust, in each case they significantly increased the risk that the <coughs> victim might get mesothelioma and must be treated as having been responsible for that tragic outcome. The reason the Supreme Court judgment is so important is because it applies to people who were exposed to very small amounts of asbestos a long time ago. Not industrial workers, but people like teachers and even pupils in schools. Diane Wilmore was one of the two cases in court today. She died of mesothelioma at 49 and is the first person to win compensation for exposure to asbestos as a pupil at this school in the 70s. Others have been waiting for today's judgment, like Sarah Bowman, who also has mesothelioma and was also exposed at school. It's going to stop the secrecy. You know, everyone's going to know. It doesn't matter, even if you're here or not, they've still got a voice. People that are no longer here, will be, their cases will be heard. And everybody can come out in the open. They can't close the doors on this anymore. Many schools have now removed asbestos, but there could still be many more cases. A legacy of mesothelioma caused by tiny exposures years ago. Lawrence McGinty, ITV News. Tottenham, Now, it was introduced in the wake of the...